Welcome. My name is Risha Ru. Uh, if you weren't able to participate in the meeting when uh, I went live, this recording that you're getting an opportunity to listen to now is being made available to you so that you could uh, hear what was discussed and also hear the report. Uh, a little bit about myself, I've chosen to use these methods in beginning the process of organizing not just this particular support group uh, that Olga thankfully encouraged me to come in and, and share and talk with the other parents and their supporters about what their interests would be in organizing a co-op in joining a cooperative or a pod as some people refer to it or and just being part of a support group of other like-minded people and parents that would be interested in furthering their work with their homeschool or a friend they know that has a homeschool. Now I'd like to begin with a little story and this story takes us back to an important moment in not just human history but in particular New York history, New York City to be exact. I knew a man and one day, he came home and his uh, girlfriend saw him and he was covered in white dust from head to toe. And she looked at him and she asked him, what's wrong with you? You're so dirty, you're so filthy. And then he said, the Twin Towers were knocked down. I use that story to give you a moment to reflect, to recognize that sometimes that's how we may feel. Um, in this community today, you know so many different pressures and challenges constantly. And you know, we just got so much dirt on us, right? in the sense of, you know, sometimes struggling, you know, to keep it all together the way we would like to have it. And yet, you know, are, are we also the people that walk by and see somebody who's struggling. We know everybody else must be dealing with their own challenges. We know how we feel when we face challenges but sometimes when we see the next person facing their challenges, we're like that girlfriend whose first impression wasn't to think, um, you know, tell me what happened. How can I help you? You know, how can I support you? I care about you. It was more to be judgmental. And so I say this story also to help you know this is a place not to be judgmental. If you've been judgmental, if you've learned to be judgmental, if you've been around people your whole life who are judgmental, this is a place to come and learn to deprogram from that way of thinking. I can't tell you how often mischaracterizations of a woman's conduct or response to a situation is often rooted in simply not understanding where she's coming from, what she may have been through. And wouldn't you agree that it's true that if you knew somebody had just lost a loved one, you might have some empathy for them? If they were upset or sad, you might offer them a kind word. But unfortunately, sometimes that small moment of acknowledgement, that small moment of being open-minded and asking the question, it never occurs. And what ends up happening is that people will judge somebody in any number of ways without taking a moment first to think. You know, these are some of the lessons I'd like to get into further down the road, right? Things that I learned along the way, lessons that were given to me, such as critical consciousness versus reactionary. How often do you find that people react verbally or emotionally to a situation and they didn't take a moment, stop and think? Now, for those of us who are parents, what tall order, what challenge do we have on our plate for what we're doing. You know, we have children to teach and we have uh, the Department of Education on some level to be con uh, conscious of what their 
uh, feedback would be. And uh, after talking to all the different parents and hearing some of the challenges they have, some that I could relate to, you know, the end result was this report. So what we did was we went through uh, the effort to form, at least if it'll be a temporary support group, and to ask the question, is there potential for the formation of more official homeschools? Strengthening the homeschools that have already been started by the people we've been able to meet and learn about each other. For people who've already initiated homeschool cooperatives, how can we support them in their efforts? How do we make sure that we uh, find a way to organize that evo avoid, excuse me, conflicts of interest? You know, there's a certain style of organizing that could be very capitalistic, very vulture, right? Very disrespectful, always this one-upmanship. But there's a whole movement and another lesson I'd like to share with everybody from the youth to the parents about this thing called the new economy and Web3. You know, these are concepts that are readily available for everybody listening to this. Yet ask yourself, how plugged are you into Web3? How plugged are you into the new economy? And have you even begun to hear whispers about the true economy? You know, these are major powerful forces that are shaping and reshaping our community, our economy, our social structures. And yet, you, do you still want to duplicate and replicate the system that's the old economy? Do you want to be a late arriver or do you want to be a trendsetter? That's a question I want you to consider as we move forward. Now, over the course of about 22 hours, I've done, <coughs> excuse me, I've done interviews with all the participants at the first few meetings. Uh, I described the process and what a W5N report is about. And we answered one simple question again and again. What do you want and what do you need? And I was able to get that down in different notes that I've taken. Everybody was able to par uh, participate and expressing themselves. And today's report is basically a synthesis. It's bringing together what everybody said. Some things that uh, one person said, everybody else also kind of said, you know? And by bringing this synergy, bringing this harmony together, offering uh, an opportunity to hear back and to be heard, and then to start to ask some questions about where we could go from here. So, as you know, word of mouth spread in this micro network of families. Some of the people involved are from New York. Some are actually living in other states. Some are parents who are already building their homeschool. Others are just starting to consider it. And of course, there's people interested in leading a homeschool pod, co-op, or support group. There's even people who are just interested in learning more about homeschooling. And there's people uh, with special skills or, 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 or trainings they can offer that are interested in supporting your homeschools and bringing their training to you. In one way or another, parents have had experience that led them to believe their children were not being treated well cared for and educated as needed and given each person's options they decided to start a homeschool and that became their best choice but one thing I've learned through all the years that I've been researching and on the ground talking with parents and people who are considering their uh, options for their children's education I found that there's two maybe three key issues that always seem to come up one, it's believing in yourself. A lot of parents, uh, you know, have their own life traumas and their own issues they've dealt with in the past. They've had their good experiences and maybe some bad experiences. And for whatever reason, they don't believe in themselves. They don't believe in their ability to establish a homeschool in their family. It could be because people who have knocked them down along the way. It could be because they've had a lot of discouraging voices in their lives. And maybe they don't feel that they have the level of education. But I want to ask you all to consider that if there's any part of you that doesn't really embrace the idea that you 
can do this. It's not all meant to be solved in the first day or the second week. It's a process. It's a learning process. And that's the most important thing you have to be willing to do is keep an open heart and keep an open mind and learn and educate yourself on what you need to do and be willing to do it to the best of your ability. And I assure you, your ability to deliver a lesson will improve from one month to the next, from one year to the next. You'll look back and be surprised at how many skills and how much knowledge you gain alongside the children you're teaching. The second issue that I've always heard uh, throughout these years expressed and has come up here in these talks has been, what is the uh, concern about dealing with the government, dealing with government paperwork? There seems to be a lot of anxiety around that. Some people shy away from getting started because for them this is all unfamiliar and there's some instinctual trigger to be scared or intimidated at the idea of breaking formation, right? Breaking the chains on the chain gang that you're on and getting free, right? There's always that hesitation, right? But here, you have a support network. I've worked with the homeschooling department for several years. I've had never had an issue. Now, I do have some habits that go back to previous years of work and training and community service. But just like me, you have your own experiences that you could translate into having the ability to do this effectively. And thanks to this process, the third issue that I've discovered, uh, I would like to consider adding to these uh, primary issues are this idea, right? I call it the spell the spell of, quote unquote, a little behind. Uh, I, I've discovered that there's certain systematic methods of oppression, there's ingrained into the psychology of the brainwashing that many educators and government workers go through, and just the state of society today to be uh, like in a rejectionary, in, in opposing a parent who's willing to consider doing something different. Just in the same way the public education system has had people from the unions and the administrations and the societies that often control them who've been uh, quick to fight back against charter schools, fight back against private schools, you know? They feel it's their duty to fight back against home schools. And that's a pretty challenging thing because be as parents, especially those people who are parents that come, parents um, hear this language about their child being left behind, they're a little behind, they're anxious that if they get investigated, the school system's gonna determine that the child is not where they need to be. And everything's always that insecurity and that anxiety around your child not developing quite like everybody else. And I wanna propose to you to consider that every child develops all the different aspects of their mind and their education at a different pace. Just because the public education system has tried to standardize everything doesn't mean that there ever was a time where every child excelled in the educational program exactly as it was done. Matter of fact, we know for uh, you know key details about how often the system fails always some group, some percentage of the people. Now this is an important challenge and we do wanna get the support where we can get it. And in time, I would like you consider to join the force of people who are gonna have a kind, assertive, and strong message that we are going to put what matters most at the center. Our children will no longer be able to be used as pawns in greater political schemes. And whenever we feel, and our child feels, that a different education model may be better for them, we should be able to move back and forth without any insecurities, without any delays, without any interferences. So think about those three things and ask yourself how much are you affected by any one or more of them. One, believing in yourself and your ability to do this. Two, having the willingness and the courage to face the system and know what you need to do and doing it well. And third, 
breaking the spells, breaking the psychological programming that says if your child's not in public school, then they're gonna get left behind, or always worrying that your child's a little behind. You know, every child is different and it's important to assess their individual learning styles, where they're having strengths, where they have room for improvement. And these basic assessment tools are readily available and is exactly what any professional teacher would do. And it's something we could all learn to do as well, together. Now I want to address a few things. There's a few things we call ground rules or non-negotiables. And moving forward, I want you to ask yourself, is this something that you're readily prepared to stick with? Or is this something that you're not able to or not interested? You know, for any group I'm involved with, I would propose these and I'm open to other people making additional propositions, but we don't want to get into crosstalk and we don't want to get into debating over things such as um, if one person uses one type of word to describe something and another person uses a different word that we begin to bicker and debate. That's called semantics. Potato, potato, public school, non-public school, homeschool, is your child in school? Yes, no, right? There's a lot of different terminology that's system terminology. There's terminology that's culturally specific. And depending on how developed the person is in their walk as a, uh, as a teacher, as an educator, they may be familiar with other words less than or more than you. And that's okay. The idea is to develop the skill to get at the heart of what the person's attempting to communicate. Not to argue and bicker over whether we call something this or that, because that's not gonna be productive, not for the individual and not for the group. If we see a weakness in somebody's communication, in committee, we could develop a word list, right? In many books and many lectures, and lessons, there's a defined list of words so that at least you know what the group consensus is about what they mean when they use certain words. The next thing is, I believe it's important that we have a democratic process. This might scare some people away because they're so familiar with the authoritative, dictatorial style of leadership. You know, whether they've been in gangs or street organizations or street tribes or they're a member of this society or that society, usually you're used to there being one person or one central group of people that make all the decisions and everybody else has to follow in order to their commands. That is one way of organizing. I would argue that maybe there are times when that type of leadership is exactly the style of leadership that you may need for certain conditions. But here in the group that I'm creating to provide support to whoever shows up, there's a point where we go from talking to action. And as you hear the report, you'll understand that everybody has to be willing to give and everybody has to be willing to receive support. That's the only way that I know that it ever works. So in order to determine whether something could be moved on, accomplished, done, whether we agree to do something or not, the simplest way to do that is through a vote. A quorum is when a minimum number of people within a group are present to make the vote. If you have 10 people, then perhaps your quorum is six. If you have five people, perhaps your quorum is three. You want a majority of the people to be present and for that vote to happen because the simple principle of voting is the majority uh, you will vote and whatever that vote is, that's what the group is gonna decide. And that's why it's also important to attend meetings and read the notes and know what's going on. Uh, another issue with the democratic voting system within a group and the cooperation we hope to achieve is that sometimes uh, the vote doesn't go your way. You think we should go to Pelham Bay Park and the majority votes to go to Fire Island. The correct thing to do in this situation, given that you could express your dissent, you could express your reasons why, give people a chance to hear why you think one idea is better than the other, 
But there comes a point where the true power of collective work and cooperation and a democratic process comes together when the person who doesn't win the vote doesn't sink into a psychological state where they're dealing with rejection and they're dealing with depression and they're getting angry and they can't accept it. That doesn't work. You all have to be ready to recognize that there's going to be times where the vote may go the way you like and there's going to be times where the vote doesn't go the way you like. But these ground rules and the things that we've agreed to and the track record we create together, our victories and the challenges we face, is going to be best served by people recognizing that by participating in the process, sharing your thoughts respectfully, and making your vote where you think it should go. And when that vote does or doesn't turn out the way you like, you support it, whatever the group decided, either way. Uh, the next uh, ground rule is about respect. We need to respect each other. We need to respect each other's time. We need to respect each other's energy. We need to respect each other's identity, however we choose to identify ourselves. And we come from a very diverse group of people. And that's important that we acknowledge that we really want to put things into place that encourages everybody to grow in their capacity to uh, be self-respect and also to respect others. Honor, that goes back to democratic voting, but it's also a stand apart. Honor the group, honor each other, honor your families, honor the community, right? And, and this is gonna help us all to recognize what we need to do on a situation by situation basis. Next, effective dialogue. If you're not familiar with what effective dialogue is, I could share some resources with you but there's a number of practical skills that come with being in a group. And I'm sure that you have been in situations where you've known right away when you had somebody or some peoples in a group that did not know how to communicate effectively, that did not know how to share the mic, that did not understand the difference between a monologue and a dialogue. You know, there's a place for both. But in this group, we want to give everybody a chance to share. We want to respect what they say. We want to give everybody a chance to voice their opinion and vote so we could get things done. The next one is privacy. What we're doing here, I believe, is a sacred act of love and sharing from our families to our community. Anybody who shows up with ulterior motives to spy, to violate the confidence, to disrupt the group, you know, they're horrible. Uh, presence is not needed and whenever me or anybody in the group has a feeling that somebody's present for ulterior motives our job is to investigate that collectively determine if that's true and when necessary eject people from the group who don't seem to be here for the right reasons and this is also about mutual support mutual support is I give of my time you're willing to give of your time. We all take time to assess how much time we have available. Another lesson I'd like to go into is about time management. Many people don't have very good time management skills. They're like a boat that's floating down the water without a paddle and they're letting the tide take them to and fro without any sense of direction. Life is just like a hamster wheel for many people. Some people call it the rat race. You know, we don't deserve to live that way. We don't deserve to model that before our children. If we intend for them to be powerful, independent, strong-willed, strong-minded people who could have a vision, have a dream, set the course, and go in that direction. Get themselves where they want to be and not let the world around them steer them or control them or manipulate them. What do you think of that? Third, there's no room for clicks a hierarchy or other issues that can arise when people have hidden agendas. You know, that's one thing about me. You'll find that every group that I'm a part of today, every healthy relationship that I have, is primarily with people that reflect these types of values. We're transparent. We have nothing to hide. You know, maybe we will be discretionary when we meet people uh, to be taking time to get to know them, get a feel for them, 
know their character, know their intentions, and decide from there if we want to build that relationship, leave it where it's at, or end the relationship. So this is the key things that I've learned from uh, many different organizations I've worked with and that today I'm still a part of. And these are the things I'd like to propose for this group to consider. This would be one of the vo uh, voting points. And the idea is, you know, if you have something you'd like to add or feedback on this, please feel free to send me a message, send me an email, or give me a call. And I'll add it to the list. And it'll be part of a guiding document, a, a, a living document that we're helping each other to create. Now, illuminated by the teachings and leadership, mentoring, and otherwise decent people in groups such as the Universal Zulu Nation, various Black Panther, Young Lord, American Indian Movement, Brown Beret, as well as other social justice grassroots organizations, human rights organizations, and revolutionary formations. One of the key things to recognize is there's three parts to the work that we do. First is organizing, second is educating, and third is uh, agitation. In my approach to this idea, I believe that whenever you meet somebody and you can acknowledge each other and share common ground, your goal should be to start organizing together, to start sharing your time and knowledge and what you can to build towards a common goal. That could be done between just a couple of people or that could be done with whole groups of people. But in the event that you notice that you're not effectively organizing or able to organize, it's important to take a step back, take that next step, and move into more of an educational paradigm. Perhaps there's something you just don't know about the person or they don't know about you. Perhaps there's an oversight, some miscommunication that is causing some uh, distrust. And as you educate with each other, learning from each other, getting to know each other, sharing about different topics and issues of concern, you start to get a feel for whether you are able to organize with that person or not. And the third part, agitation. At some point, once your group has enough shared knowledge, organized together, there's gonna to be challenges. There's gonna be things that will agitate you and things in our world that you may be agitating towards. For instance, the idea of a network of successful uh, home schools fighting for their rights to improve their conditions is going to be offensive to any number of people who don't want to see anything change. So we want to be prepared for when we start to announce the vision, the plan, when we start to organize with more groups and people. It's going to take time to get to know each other, to educate each other, to organize with each other. And this time has to come apart from everything else we're doing. So in this uh, way, in light of that, I start by talking about some things that the group has shared about that we must consider organizing. First, establishing each homeschool officially. What would make your homeschool official? Well, do you have a name for your homeschool? Have you considered organizing your homeschool? Setting it up as a not-for-profit organization? Developing uh, a, a plan, a business plan, a, a website? Building your archives of photography, your children's portfolios? And if you don't have a homeschool and looking to start a homeschool, the question remains the same for you. If you're looking to support homeschools, is this an area where you could be a support? Do you know of other resources, educators, more people in the community, uh, trainer aspect that could potentially bring that information forward to help parents discover how to do that? There's ways to set up an organization where you could end up paying yourself full time as a teacher, having a budget to get resources for your students, and potentially putting yourself in a position 
to be much more comfortable as you're doing this work, not dependent on somebody else to make sure that you and your children's basic human needs are met. The next thing is establishing a homeschool coalition. The homeschool coalition would be uh, uh, any number of homeschools, a uh, number of co-ops, pods, that can get on board with this vision that's a very compelling vision for the future of education in our community, in the city, and around the country. That's very important. To recognize that vision's already out there, it's already being advocated, seeds have been planted, and in the case of this group, I've shared with you all openly the vision that I've developed over these last seven years, and I would love to have you working with me in some of the groups that I'm advocating for to get funds, funds for this group, funds for this movement, ways to expand the work that I'm doing as a homeschool professional. I would love to have your support and involvement in that effort. I believe that there's millions of dollars out there waiting to go get, and I'm working on going and getting it. You wanna join me on that effort? Step up. The next thing that came up in the different interviews that were done was how to provide stability and safety to our homeschools and all involved adults, youth, children, and our allies. Let's be honest, one of the greatest things that has been causing insecurity for many people, especially with their children, is the simple question, can I trust this person around my children? Now, in the world we live in today, in this country, many people have to go through background checks. In the case of working with children, getting a child abuse clearance, making sure a person is not a sexual predator that has been convicted of a crime previously. Now, even though you might be telling yourself, like I would say, I have my child abuse clearance. I have my criminal background check. I, I've never been charged of almost any crime, let alone something that would be considered so serious as some type of sexual predatory action. But it's a good reassuring step for us all to consider making sure that we can provide that. That we're all able to step forward and say, here's my child abuse clearance. Here's my criminal background. Here's, uh, you know, the, the registry information. I'm not on there. And anything else that anybody feels would be a good idea to have that reassurance that as we all come together, we don't get sucker punched by some unexpected development when we discover that somebody has a drug problem that they're not getting help with. Somebody has a mental health issue that is obvious, it's treatable, but they're not willing to go and get the help they need. You know, there are certain issues that a person can have or could develop from time to time that maybe they can handle it on their own. But we can't have people having a nervous breakdown, being super anxious or depressed around our children. It's better for that person to take a step back and remove themselves from a role where they may inadvertently cause harm to a child psychologically or emotionally. So asking ourselves, you know, whether we want to do that as a group in order that we could begin the activities and sharing our lessons and meeting up as a group, and how, how so? For example, maybe this group or maybe your co-op may decide that there's certain crimes that, you know, you won't ask somebody uh, to have a bond or you may not ask somebody to, to, to leave the group because of them. For some people in some communities, certain crimes uh, are, are understood uh, as being part of the oppression of our people and the person has been reformed, they're a good person, they could be vouched for, there could be letters written. But maybe the group also has a vetting process that if somebody does have a criminal charge, that perhaps the group has to come and meet up and review the information and talk to the person and talk to their witnesses and ask, uh, uh, do we feel that we would like to admit this person to the group given their criminal background? We also don't want this to become a stage for the ongoing feuds between other groups. If you're a Moor, if you're a Mason, that really doesn't matter here. If you're Christian, if you're Muslim, if you're atheist, if you're Hebrew Israelite, 
if you're Taino and you practice indigenous spirituality, if you're Wicca, if you're a Satanist, at this point, nothing that anybody said in our interviews led me to believe that this isn't an open group. But your religion really doesn't matter here. So if somebody doesn't know how to keep that at home, then maybe that's something we could do a training on. You know, how do we develop our identity as a supporter, as a co-op participant, as a home teacher, and leave other aspects of our identity at home or in our neighborhood, right? And that, that's something that some people know how to do naturally. And the truth is, there's something that some people have no clue about and have no idea how to do. And that could be a disruptor in a group setting. So it's important for you all to think about that. Now, one of the key issues of our day is the Anthropocene. That's basically the end of the world, as end of life as we know it, because of the human condition and the destruction of our environment and the ecosystems. And recognizing that a collective health initiative dealing with mental health, social health, physical health, including the nervous system, the vagus nerve, mental health recovery with mental health issues that could get supported like anxiety, addiction, depression. Training on these things, resources for these things, uh, coming together and having activities that promote mental health, that promote social health, that promote physical health, and also some of the issues that adults and children have expressed, which include autism, ADHD training for youth and parents, social wellness, the assessment tools and the support groups that are available, meditation classes. And there's a lot of community support groups out there that are available for all types of issues. We could start to make a list of all the different issues that we need support with, and we could compile a resource book of all those resources that are available right there wherever you live. Next, on creating a sustainable set of educational classes. One of the things that many parents expressed was the desire to get some technical teaching training on styles of teaching, modalities and learning styles and how to prepare for the year, the month, the week, the day. Knowing how to keep a record, a log of your observations, a journal, so that as you progress, you're also able to reflect and catch some things that will emerge to you as you're doing the work. Also, this is a good point to reinsert the idea of time management training. But uh, the interest in learning different modes, such as left brain thinking, right brain thinking, techniques for boys, techniques for girls, trauma-informed teaching, indigenous workshops and classes, African uh, classes and workshops, and sovereign aboriginal concepts. Uh, other educational classes that people discuss developing as a group were home economics classes for children and adults, the basics of the law and DOE paperwork filings. Uh, again, on scheduling and time management, plus follow-up support to help each other stay on track, creating a group calendar with birthdays and holidays, cultural, political, social training with an emphasis on Native American, African, hip hop, and ethnic origins from around the globe based on the heritage of the unique mix of the participants we have. Methods for working with different age students, simultaneously you know, working with your children who may be at different uh, grade levels and ensuring that each gets the things they want and need from a great education at home school. Next, how to assess your children, how often to assess your children, not only the standardized assessments, but also how do teachers assess themselves? Starting a friendly group assessment where we can have training on how to be observers and provide productive and constructive feedback and insights into how each other are doing by coming and doing a home visit. Would you rather have a couple of parents in your support group come and observe how you're doing a class and give you some pointers before some state person comes and does something? You know, that type of, of pre, um, uh, prefiguring 
to ensure that you're delivering your educational work in a professional way can be very vital and that came up in this process. Uh, next, sharing teaching techniques that work for parents on basic subjects, teaching certain grade levels of math, teaching progression in language skills, reading, writing, thinking, speaking in a certain language. Next, the question is, in addition to all of these that I just described under the question of education and organizing, um, you know, what we want to ask now is what unique lessons, units, classes, curriculums can you teach? Would you like to consider getting that done, written up, organized, copyrighted, and publish them as a way to make money? Would you rather have something like this up on a website with your homeschool curriculum classes and lessons that people could download to print? And even if it's a dollar for a certain lesson or $10 for the whole curriculum, you have that channel open? I mean, do you have that today? Is that something you would want to work together to help establish? Based on my conversations with all the parents, everybody so far seems to be interested in doing something like that. And that's something that we could definitely do. Next, holistic health experiences, strengths, and hopes of parents around the world. Creative works. Classes on organizational leadership for parent, teachers, youth, and our allies. Forming of a homeschool as a family education institution for the generations. Changing our concept of what a homeschool really is in the past ancestrally and also what it means today and moving forward. Why is it something that every family should look into? Next, an entrepreneurial training workshop. Uh, using Taino terminology, we could establish something called the Kane Serani. And that would be the circle of people that are developing skills in trade. Also, there's youth that have expressed interest in entrepreneurship classes and the arts, crafts, music, music business, dance, and the entertainment industry. Next, legal training regarding education and beyond. There's several people in the group expressed a sincere interest in becoming, uh, you know, relatively expert with the law knowing how to defend themselves legally, knowing some of the tricks of the trade to prevent people from attempting to oppress you through legal threats. You know, so that concludes the section on what type of educational classes can we be looking to develop as a group based on what everybody has said in their interviews and in previous meetings. Uh, the next topic for this report is a question on communications. Let's be honest. Hold on a second. Let me bring this up. Okay. Let's be honest. Right now, uh, everybody's busy. Everybody has a certain amount of time that they're spending on any number of important things. But the idea of having a group becomes an additional responsibility. Is it worth it? Is it worth it to take, to find some amount of time on a daily or weekly or monthly basis to give? And if you consider the possibility that if you give one hour a week or two hours a week or 10 hours a month, you want to know what are you getting in return? Now, all these ideas that were previously expressed, very easy to do. I've been working in publishing uh, for over 20 years. Uh, from music publishing to publishing uh, new, uh, newspapers, newsletters, magazines but it takes time. And so if we say we would like to do all of this, that's fine. We could assign different people to work on different aspects of this. We could figure out who needs to be involved with which of those ideas. We could decide which ideas are more important and which ideas are less important and move forward. But we have to be willing to put the time towards it. What's the benefit? Let's use a small example. You. Participate in the work group on what are unique lessons you could offer. You go through a process of showing you how to prepare your lesson in a PDF format. 
We go through a review. We share what we were developing with each other so we could all improve the quality of our work. And then we go through a workshop where you learn how to upload your PDF to a site where people can go to pay for a download and you can provide a link. Well, that's the process. But do we want it to take 10 weeks, 10 months, or 10 years? Obviously, I would suggest to me that the more time we put in the shorter amount of time, the sooner we will be done. It doesn't have to be rushed. Those are a lot of ideas. We could pick some and we could all decide together which ones we put on the back burner. But no matter what, we have to have that time commitment. And one of the simplest and yet most important parts of the time commitment is communicating with each other. Listen, I'm not a doctor's office. I'm not a lawyer's office. I'm not somebody you have to schedule an appointment with to talk to or to see. You're more than welcome to come and give me a text and say, hey, I was thinking about this and I would like to know from you and everybody at some point if you're ready to have that type of relationship where we can reach out to each other when we have ideas or inspirations or we need help with something. But deciding on which communication channel is preferable, what's more effective, is going to be something we should work on right away. Whether we should have in-person meetings, whether Telegram is the best tool, whether you prefer Signal, WhatsApp, text messages, phone calls, if you prefer Blue Jeans or Zoom, let's all be honest with each other. You know, I'm the kind of person that has turned off all my notifications. Like somebody might text me or try to call me and I won't know right away. And the reason why I turn off notifications is I get so bombarded with messages after messages and emails that I just decided it doesn't work for me. But if you had to reach me, I don't like having to check my telegram, then check my signal. Sometimes I might miss one. The one that's best for me is just a simple text message or a phone call. I know that may be old school for some people, but that's what's best for me. You know, and maybe something else is what's best for you and we should have a database where we have critical information about each other, also knowing what's the best way to reach you. Next point in the report, on fundraising and resourcefulness. What are resources? When you ask most people what's the most important thing you need in life, they're gonna say what? Yeah, money. That's what most people say. I don't come from that philosophy. I know about it, I grew up in it, I've decided to rebel against that philosophy. And yet in that rebelling, I wanted to do better, I wanted to do smarter. And so when I've listened to people in my life talk to me about things that matter most, usually it's not money that comes first. Some of the millionaires and billionaires I've met and some of the most successful people I've met in my life, they actually say time. Time is the most important resource. And here's a few points why. We all get only so much of it. We all get to decide where we invest it. And every human being gets the same amount every day to invest. What we choose to do with our time over the course of time will determine the outcomes of our life. Every experience we ever had can be tracked back to a time and a place. If we choose to organize, if we choose to form new relationships, if we choose to exercise, whatever we choose to do with our time, in time we'll see the results of that choice. And one day, in one moment, we all will have our last second alive here on this earth. Given some exceptions that some people believe in, but for today, for what I'm sharing in the collective conscious of the group, we all die at some point. And on that moment, when we take our last breath, then we have no more time. So we need to respect our own time. We need to treat time with more respect. And don't you know, isn't it a funky coincidence that this system of capitalist exploitation, what's the first thing they try to figure out how to get from you? Your time. They want you to spend so much time worried about their dreams and their ambitions that they've trained up whole populations to put their own God-given purpose, their own dreams, 
put their own marriages, put their own families to the back burner so that you could get some of this little bit of money, but giving a lot of your time. And so that's why I believe in entrepreneurialism. That's why our ancestors were people who trade from uh, land to land, from people to people, it's in our blood. But growing up in the industrial age and the industrial age and the uh, white supremacist society with all its designs to exploit us and use us and rob us of our lives, not the least of which is taking up most of our time. I, I, I don't have any qualms with somebody that's proud to have spent their whole life doing a certain job at a certain place and they feel that they're entitled to some special treatment. I don't give a fuck if you was a government worker, if you worked in the military, if you worked in any number of jobs, because let's be honest, between the military, the federal government, the state government, the police, the libraries, the public schools, if you really think about it, a significant number of people work for the government in one level or capacity. But that's okay. For me, I don't define people on what kind of job they do. To me, that's kind of like silly. What defines people to me is what kind of human being you are. How do you treat yourself? How do you treat your family? How do you treat your people? Given that you may have some people and family members that have gone crazy. But it's important to recognize that in, 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 in this group, what I offer to share is that once we have some shared consciousness about what matters most and what we want to teach our children and what we don't want to teach our children, we're going to need to then, after that course of action, after that agreement has been made, then we ask the question about money. We could get grants. We could do fundraising activities together. I, I mean, I don't know. I have some skills that I could donate. Maybe you have some skills you could donate. Maybe we could do a car wash. We could open up channels where people could offer us donations. We could go sticker bomb the whole city and put a QR code to our website that says, support our homeschool, it's the best. And we could get up there and get out there and hustle, right? Legit things that we could do to build, to get money. Not just for the group, but for our own homeschools, and that could also make life better for our families. Because one thing that I've learned in all my years of business training is that if you are a laborer or worker, props to you, but you're going to have a salary cap. There's only so much money they're going to pay you for a certain amount of time. But if you choose the path like our ancestors to be more entrepreneurial, to be a Serrani, to be somebody who goes and explores and takes the risks and takes on the challenge and develops their ability to sell things and build their own businesses, then perhaps that level you could achieve is much greater. Another thing that I wanted to mention on this is in regards to time, there's a whole movement, I don't know if you've heard about it, but it's called time banking. And it's a whole system and a, a program, a, a app that's really awesome that allows a group of people to exchange their time, like a time economy. And I think that's something we should consider implementing. Again, I mentioned earlier, I don't know if you caught it, but I mentioned about the new economy and the true economy. I think that's something very important for everybody to become aware of and to think about how they could get participating in it. Now, the final section of this report on activities and events. One thing everybody expressed interest in is having a group activities. We could start sharing about different activities we know about and what we're using now, the telegram. I have a dozen activities I've been holding back on sharing till after this report. And I would love for people to say, hey, I wanna go to that. And maybe you have something coming up. Maybe you'll do a barbecue. I don't know, maybe you have an idea for something, but be feeling free to bring it forward. The next thing, meetings. Meetings are usually not the most popular thing in any organization, just meeting up and talking about things, but they are essential. There's a few ways to do it. <laughs> but it seems like people are cool with having meetings, but maybe not as uh, often as every week. Next, outings. If we're gonna have outings, are we gonna have outings that cost money? And what kind of rules or procedures do we wanna have? For instance, if we know we're gonna have five families going somewhere, 
Should we assign one or two people to be, in essence, like a security detail to keep their eye on the group, to make sure when we're moving around that everybody's safe, everybody's getting on or off the train safely. If one person is ahead of the group, another person behind the group, they're on a walkie-talkie app. If somebody says, hey, there's a problem up here, like stop. You know, do we want to put those types of measures into place when we're out and about? And, 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 and I recognize one of the things that people expressed is an interest in free and low cost events and activities. There's a number of free and low cost events activities all, all across the city. Uh, and I'm happy to share about them. And I hope you all will share about the ones you find out about with. Also, I don't think we should forget about the people in the group who live out of state or travel out of state. I think it would be nice to figure out uh, if the group can research things in their community as well and or figure out ways to do stuff that's online so everybody who could participate. So in conclusion, there's a few things we need to do. Uh, develop a way of a system to agree to vote and make some decisions about what was expressed. Okay, cool. Thanks a lot, Elizabeth. I, I saw your message. Uh, I'm actually recording it as well in the audio so that I can share that with everybody who couldn't be here tonight. Uh, next, are we going to stick together as a group? Are we going to all do our own thing? Are we going to come together? Are we going to be separate and distinct organizations? That's a good thing to ask. Um, we don't want one co-op that's trying to get everybody to sign up with them. Or maybe that's what we should do. Or maybe we all establishing our own homeschool organization and that's the direction everybody would like to go in. And we're just a group of schools coming together as equals with nobody above anybody else. Of all the educational ideas that were discussed, what's the most important ones for you? Which ones would you like to start on right away? If we could put some of these decisions down, make a vote, I'm ready to get started on some of these other things. Getting together, having activities, developing our schools, developing our, our classes and curriculums, some of these legal workshops. There's some that really jump out at me, but I'm not here to make the final decision for the whole group. Uh, finally, we need to have the act uh, to, to have the courage to act, the courage to change. There's some things we may need to change as we grow and learn in this process. And we also need to learn not to be so always on the defense. Sometimes that's what the environment around us promotes and we feel overwhelmed. And I understand that just as much as you. I have to be dad and mom every day. Uh, and nobody's, you know, a lot of my extended family, you know, cares less about me in my life. Uh, but I don't let that overcome me. You know, at times we could all suffer from the rejection and isolation we can feel. We wonder, is this really what's best for my child? Or maybe there's been times when your child was struggling and they might say something like, why can't I just go to public school? They think they have an easy out. Maybe that's happened to you, maybe that hasn't. I know a lot of that stuff has happened to me along the way. But at some point I put my foot down and I said, in my home, this is what we do and this is why. And I wanna make sure that I do my best job for my, my son. I wanna make sure I do my best job for this group. A more formal draft of this report can be shared. If that's what everybody would like, I could write it down, we could transcribe it. There's also an audio recording um, that will be shared so everybody can listen to this in their leisure. And this is a living report. This isn't meant to be signed, sealed, and delivered and done, but I want you all to pose questions. I will be happy to receive constructive criticisms, and I want to help develop this into a guiding document that can be published and supported by all involved now and in the future. Perhaps one day there'll be a website for all of us together where this original report and this guiding document becomes part of our story about how we built the amazing things we're gonna build together. With that, I sign off, and I now open the floor up to comments and questions.
I appreciate the space. I didn't catch the first half of it, but I will definitely be um, tuning in once it's posted. I really enjoy the the um, indigenous uh, mention of classes. I didn't even think of those in particular as to like add to the meeting. So I'm glad that like this group was, is amazing in having thought of that because I think that is important, especially now. Um, you know, we're still learning who we are. It's unfortunate that it took us this long. We're in our 30s and 40s, and we're like, you know, we're still trying to answer that question for ourselves. So it is important that we, like, set our youth, our children on better than what we were, for sure. And I really appreciate that aspect that I'm really grateful for whoever put those details into, into, pro, like, into existence, because I didn't even think about that. That's great. That's amazing. And... Also, I am willing to like, so I'm willing to meet up a hundred percent. I think it's important. You know, I know that one of the biggest concerns when I know when anyone asks me about why, about my choices for homeschooling, one of the biggest things I get in feedback is, well, what about their social life? Like having to socialize with other kids. And I'm like, that's. That's, I, I never saw that as an issue because if you go outside, you can socialize with kids. <laughs> you, you know, like it's, I felt like it was just a, you know, people think differently. And I'm like, hey, we won't have to endure like a bully. I'm sure there'll be little things here and there that need resolve, but it wouldn't be as severe as what you would experience in a, in a school, in a public school setting. I'm really, I'm really excited about what I was able to hear because again, I was having some network issues. So some stuff like took like cut out, um, you know, unexpectedly. Um, those classes, the workshops. Now with the workshops, do you think would be per predominantly like virtual? Um, or are you, or, or like kind of do like a hybrid mix whoever can make in person and then offer it virtually? What do you think would be the best way to tackle like workshops like that especially for the administration itself i think i think you mentioned like i it was starting to cut out a little bit my connection but i think you mentioned like when planning like like trips and outings and things like that i think that's great and i think that goes along with the social aspect for the children and for the parents as support to each other like remember our you know that saying, everyone knows that saying, it takes a village, but no one really, really knows what that means. <laughs> and it's like, we really can be, we are really in a position to create the village, to be, give each other permission to course correct even each other's kids, not in a disciplinary action, but hey, why do you think you feel that way? Like, you know, ask, like, be more the reflective part of of the extended of the extension of parenting you're not taking place of that child's parent but you are an extension of the parenting responsibility and of course of like what constitutes abuse in every parent's eyes so we could have a common denominator of how we could speak to each other's children and ultimately you're gonna grow a bond with these other children the more we're in tune with them and the more we're organizing events together so i think it's just part of the community and um, the village part of it that that comes with it and like you said i like the part that you said it's not about whether you're more a national uh, a christian atheist is about like of course you want to be around families with same values but usually the values are core and they don't really have to do with these very narrow lines of of belief systems is about like putting those those details aside and have common ground like okay you know you may be an atheist but you believe in do you believe in any higher power it's not even about that can we respect the child can we respect each other and who we are today in our human nature let's start there like i really like those points that you brought up because I didn't even think about it. Like when we, when I think of people, I don't really want to characterize, char like or not characterize, um, categorize who people are. Like we're here as educators together. So I, I, those are really good points that you brought up, and I'm really glad 
that you vocalized them and mentioned them. Um, and I, I'm just bouncing off of that. Like, I really see where you came with that. Like, it's not about all of that. It's about what are we bringing to the table for the children? You have the choice to participate in specific activities when it comes to, like, especially you said, you mentioned African heritage, Taino heritage, indigenous work. Like, people can either participate or not, depending on what they want their child to kind of engage in. And... And I think that's great, like just to even have the options. And I will say, you know, I just like I text you. I, I we just came back from that, you know, woods, and it was such an amazing experience. And I was thinking when you were mentioning certain things, we can have overnight trips that we're like camping. You know, like yeah, the fact is we are gonna have to put put out money and invest in certain outings. That's factual, like. Some, most museums we could get into for free because first of all if you live in new york it's all suggested donation you could give them a penny so there's a there's activities we will be able to do in the city for free but there are things that we're gonna have to put up funds for and you know fundraising for those things um is great saving for those things budgeting we can you know including the in the curriculum and teaching the kids because they have to know home economics you know budgeting is part of that so like it, i think that was a great report and i and i but i agree with a lot of it which what i was able to hear um i think it was just great but i think and you know it would be great to kind of I'm trying to picture like the indigenous um, work with like in, in in settings like like camping settings and things like that. Like astrology, let's take out this telescope. Um, who has a telescope? Let's let's bring out the, our tools and let's let's figure out how to organize this because you know the kids are gonna be excited. How do we organize it so we could all get a turn at looking through it so we can, so they can all feel a part of it. No one feels left out. And if the, they do feel left out, how do we rewind and, and fix that sensation that they're feeling? You know, like, I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm excited to participate, um, to actually, like, you know, put together maybe a, a class that I can like teach myself and those skills and and just yeah looking at that big guy right now <laughs> <laughs>